Today, we're taking a trip to Toronto, Canada, to document one of the most high-profile crimes in history. Almost six years later, an investigation is still ongoing, and the perpetrator hasn't been caught. As you'll find out, there are so many potential suspects to this crime that we may never know who killed the Sherman couple. So let's find out what happened today. Barry Sherman was born on February 25th, 1942, and from a young age, he was considered a genius. When Barry was in high school, he won at the National Physics Contest and graduated from Forest Hill Collegiate Institute at the top of his class. At the age of just 16, he went on to be one of the youngest people to attend the University of Toronto. He studied in the university's engineering science program and would brag about how he only applied for it because it was the hardest course. In the summer, Barry worked at a pharmaceutical company called Empire Laboratories, owned by his uncle, Louis Lloyd Winter. He received his PhD in rocket science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1967, at the age of just 25 years old. He continued to work at his uncle's pharmaceutical company for a few years as a driver, until unexpectedly, Louis and his wife, Beverly, died. Barry then used his mother's life savings to purchase Empire Laboratories. After a few years, he sold the company and founded his own, named Apotex Inc., a now infamous company in the pharmaceutical world. At the same time as this, he met his wife, Honey Reich, in 1971, who was also a U of T student. They got married and had four kids, Jonathan, Alexandra and Kaylin. They settled down in a 12,000 square foot, $7 million mansion with an indoor pool. The success of this company made him a billionaire by the early 2000s. And by the 2010s, he was Canada's 12th richest man with a humble net worth of at least 3.2 billion US dollars. To the public, he was known as a great and reputable person. He most famously donated $50 million to a Jewish charity, despite not being religious himself. He donated another $50 million to hospitals and impoverished areas around the world. He was a philanthropist at heart and all round great guy. Honey was a very extroverted person who enjoyed partying and making new friends. Barry was quite the opposite. He would work at least 16 hours a day even when they were on vacation. His wife was very supportive of him and she would never interrupt him when he wanted to be on the phone or going through paperwork. Life was good for the Shermans, until it wasn't. By December 2017, the Sherman kids were all adults. Barry and Honey had been planning on selling their $7 million house on 50 Old Colony Road and building a much bigger house in Forest Hill where they would wind down for the last stage of their life and live in an area closer to where Barry's business partners and friends were living. The new house was going to be so big that they had to get special legal permits in order to build it. Because of this, the couple spent a lot of time being preoccupied and weren't as focused on the pharmaceutical company. This began to create some odd and noticeable changes in their behaviours towards the end of the year. On December 12th, Honey didn't show up to an important meeting and didn't let anyone know in advance that she would miss it. The next day, Barry sent an email to their staff about one of their patents, but he wasn't heard from for the rest of the day. Barry suffered from insomnia and would usually phone call with his friends and business partners late at night to pass time. But then again, he was busy, so it is what it is. But people started becoming concerned when both of them were no-shows the next day. Neither of them was seen on the 14th, which had never happened before. But then again, they're busy with personal stuff, right? No need for concern. The next day, a real estate agent came to the Sherman's house 
to give a tour to a couple interested in the home. It was expected that morning that the couple would be out busy. So the real estate agent used a key in a lockbox at the front door to let himself and the couple in. The cleaners were already inside the house as usual. But it was when they got to the indoor pool when they would find something shocking. On the floor, next to the pool, Barry and Honey were found sitting on the floor with leather belts tied around their necks. Honey had a large bruise on her face and they both had restraints on their arms. Their faces were purple and grimacing, but they were fully clothed. The police were called immediately and upon their arrival, more disturbing discoveries were made. Honey's phone, which she barely used, was found in the bathroom in such a way that it looked like she unsuccessfully tried to call someone for help. <coughs> Calling it tragic and unexpected would be a gross understatement. Toronto police are saying very little about what they found yeah. inside the mansion of pharmaceutical billionaire Barry Sherman and his wife Honey. They left it to officials at the company Sherman founded 50 years ago, Apotex Pharmaceuticals, to announce the Sherman's sudden death. All police will say is that they are treating the deaths as suspicious. It means that we're investigating it to determine if there is foul play involved or not. And at this point, we cannot with 100% certainty say that there is or is not. Over 7,000 people showed up to their funeral, most being Jewish people who admired their contributions to the community in Toronto. Within days after the crime, the police determined that the couple had died by strangulation from the leather belts and almost immediately believed that it was a murder-suicide done by Barry. Considering Honey had a bruise on her face, and it seemed like she had resisted or tried to run, it would somewhat make sense. Another factor that contributed to this theory is that there was no sign of forced entry to the house, and no other DNA or footprints at the crime scene that would suggest someone else was there. In other words, if someone killed them, they would have had to put a lot of planning into not getting caught. The Sherman kids understandably disagreed with this theory. The house had nine different entrances, and Barry and Honey were the type of people who would have answered the door to just about anyone, even a complete stranger. If someone acted like they were in serious danger or needed help, they could have manipulated one of the two into letting them in. Then all they would need to do is not leave any fingerprints or footprints. Frustrated with the police's investigation, the Sherman siblings hired one of the most prominent private investigators, Brian Greenspan. Brian hired his own investigative team, who conducted a second autopsy. The autopsy contradicted the police theory that it was a suicide, and the investigation into their murders was afoot. When considering who a potential suspect could be, there were some important things to note. To reiterate what's already known at this point, the couple's bodies were found on December the 15th, but the last time they were heard from was the 13th when Barry sent out an email. That means there was a pretty wide margin of time. They could have been killed at any point from the night of the 13th to the morning of the 15th. At the same time, the lack of footprints and physical evidence meant that whoever was responsible for the crime knew what they were doing. The first obvious thing to look at was the lockbox at the front door of the house that the real estate agent used. If there was no forced entry, then the person who killed them must have had access to the house somehow. All of the people who knew the code, which included cleaners, relatives and the agent, were interviewed by police. 37 warrants were obtained for searches, which again all became dead ends. The police looked through over 2,000 hours of security camera footage from the surrounding house when they made a big breakthrough.
Although it appears mundane at first, this 20 second long video has been believed to be the suspect who murdered the couple. The timing of this individual's appearance is in line with when we believe the murders took place, said Detective Brandon Price. The person in the video was the first officially classified suspect in the investigation, but more work would need to be done to identify who they were. Some things about Barry's character began to surface, which would be contrary to how many people saw him. For example, when Barry took control of Empire Laboratories in the 1970s, he took ownership under the condition that he would employ all of his Louis Winter's kids, his cousins, when they turned 21. Since Barry sold the company before they turned 21, this voided the deal. This angered the Winter's children, and in 2011, they sued him for 20% of equity in Apotex. Barry responded by cutting off all their financial assistance, which they claimed was used to prevent them from learning about their right to Empire Laboratories in the first place. In 2017, the Winters lost the case, and Barry conveniently died only a few months later. This lawsuit was understandably not the fault of Barry. It was in his legal right to void the contract and sell his shares. The cousins didn't have any right to sue him, or be angry for what he did. But this doesn't even scratch the surface of who Barry alienated throughout his career. A law professor at the University of Ottawa named Emir Ataran claimed that Barry was a deplorable human being who purposefully drove the prices of drugs up so that he would make more money. He allegedly cared far more about profits than about delivering better drugs to Canadian households. He reportedly owed more than $1 billion to other pharmaceutical companies for various reasons, and he admitted that he wasn't planning on paying up. In the 1990s, he sued multiple companies for their patented drugs, in fear that patented drugs would kill the generic drug industry. Throughout his career, he filed more than 1,200 lawsuits against government agencies, other corporations, and even individuals who criticised some of his drugs as being ineffective. Although many politicians and normal people believed he was a good person, it seemed like he may have had more sinister and selfish intentions underneath. In the late 1990s, Barry even alluded to the possibility that he might be murdered. For a thousand bucks paid to the right person, you can probably get someone killed. Perhaps I'm surprised that hasn't happened yet, he said later on. So, to recap, Barry Sherman and his wife Honey were seemingly killed out of nowhere, for no motive, which is why it was considered a murder-suicide at first, but there's no solid evidence to prove this, and with further CCT evidence and autopsy reports, it became obvious that it was a murder. The police also interviewed anyone who had access to the lockbox at the front of the house, which included cleaners, close family, and the real estate agent, but to no avail. As the investigation continued, tons of evidence came out that Barry was unethical in many ways throughout his career, which gave far too many possible motives and suspects for it to be even worth chasing any of them. I could seriously make an hour and a half long documentary just covering the controversy of Barry Sherman. With a lack of physical evidence, this makes it basically impossible to narrow it down to a single suspect. The case of Barry and Honey Sherman will most likely never be solved unless another breakthrough happens. On April 25th, 2019, the police said they have a working theory about what happened, but there's been no updates since then. By the end of 2019, the private investigation closed inconclusively. In December of 2022, the Sherman kids set a reward of $25 million to anyone who comes forward with evidence that leads to the persecution of someone. What do you think about the case? Did Barry and Honey both have it coming to them? And more importantly, 
Who is the person in the video? Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. More longer documentary form videos will come in the future. Thanks for watching.